grows next to salt water. I dropped my pack to the ground and stared at Grand Plateau Glacier. I wasn't as tired as I'd been after crossing Cape Fair with her, but I was feeling the wear and tear of the past few days in my knees and shoulders. Quadi Den Chin Chi had been found 4,500 feet above sea level, which meant that give or take a few hundred feet for however far the glacier had traveled since he died, he could have been as high as 5,000 feet or more. Yet glasswort, which has a high water content, is quickly digested, and the location where he was found was nearly 70 miles from the nearest salt water. In other words, he had been traveling remarkably fast and light. Two pieces of dried chum salmon, a species that spawns only in the lower coastal reaches of the region's rivers, were also found among his things. The glasswort in his stomach indicated that he'd left the coast less than three days before he died. Yet he'd already hiked, climbed, and pushed himself to an altitude that even a well-equipped climbing party might take weeks to reach. There it was thought he'd probably been caught in a storm and died of hypothermia. I looked at the sweep of the glacier rising into regions of permanent snow and naked stone and wondered what could have sent a young man on such a mad scramble across such inhospitable mountains. The evidence shows that after a life on the coast, he'd gone inland for a few months, then returned to the coast for a brief period, then turned around and set off again almost immediately on what must have been amounted to a headlong run across terrain that usually forces people to move slowly and carefully or prevents them from traveling at all. The beach asparagus, the salmon, and the pollen found on his clothes indica indicated they had almost surely been traveling during the first or middle part of August, at the end of the summer, when the chum salmon were running. But radiocarbon dating of his equipment indicates that his final journey took place sometime during the tail end of the Little Ice Age, when conditions would have been more extreme than they were by the time I stood on the edge of the lake wondering about his motives. I was also puzzled by how he could have been caught by a storm. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that after decades of living and working at sea and in the wilds of Alaska, I have a weather eye that's somewhat more acute than the average city dwellers. Armed with the knowledge and experience of his ancestors, the young warrior must have been able to look at the sky and sniff the wind for approaching weather changes with a, with a skill a quantum leap beyond my own. It was hard for me to believe that he didn't know what he was looking at when he saw the sky begin to darken, or when the clouds wrapped themselves around the peaks took on the lenticular shape that means strong winds are blowing a lot. But for some reason, he kept going. Then I remembered how when I'd been in my 20s, I'd fallen in love with a dark-eyed girl with a quick smile who lived in Anchorage, 135 miles from where I was living, in the small town of Seward, at the far end of a narrow, winding highway that was often closed by blizzards and avalanches. I was making my living as a fisherman, long line in halibut during the summer and picking up odd jobs as a carpenter and a sawmill hand in the winter. I owned a 1963 Dodge pickup with 90,000 miles on the odometer that I bought for 300 bucks at a U.S. Forest Service surplus auction. Gas was 60 cents a gallon and love to paraphrase a country and western song popular at the time was only $3 away. The affair burned like magnesium through July and August, on into autumn and deep into the heart of winter. By the time that dark-eyed girl, dark girl called on a stormy December evening to say how much she missed me, Frequent trips up and down the highway had worn the tires on the Dodge paper fin. The only gas station in town in those days closed at 6 o'clock, and the gas gauge was on empty. But there was a tone in her voice that said she really wanted to see me, and she wanted to see me that night. The highway department had already announced that a road closure was imminent due to the avalanche danger. But a sympathetic friend helped me siphon five gallons of fuel from a generator at the sawmill where he was a night watchman. I stuffed three $1 bills into an envelope, pushed it under the door of the mill's office, and was on my way, sliding almost out of control in wet snow that was already a foot deep and growing deeper every minute. The barrage of fat, wet flakes was coming down so thick and fast that the windshield wipers could hardly keep up with it. Six hours later, I was still crawling along at 20 miles an hour, working the stick shift and trying to stay off the brakes as I slipped around past the flashing yellow morning lights 130 miles away at the northern end of the worst of it. It was one o'clock in the morning before I got to her cabin on the outskirts of Anchorage, but the lamp in the window was still burning. There's no fever in the world like it. I'm standing there in the cold north wind, watching ruffled white caps roll across the land plateau lake towards me. I remembered how that flame and love had eventually burned down and gone out, then wondered how long or if the diminishing fires of my own marriage could be kept burning. I had no doubt that Kwadi Den Chin Chi, after coming of age on the coast, had, had gone inland, perhaps with a trading party, and met a girl with dark eyes and long black hair who, who 
moved in a way that reminded him of tall grass in the wind and touched something inside of him that he'd never known before. Any serious scientist would rightly scoff at such a notion for lack of evidence. But I had no trouble envisioning quite a Dan Chin Chi stumbling back to his home on the coast with his heart still behind him somewhere in the interior. What else could account for a young man in the prime of his life throwing a knife, a few chunks of fish and some odds and ends into a bag, and taken off at what must have amounted to a dead run across such hostile territory? What else would push a man up into that world of ice and bald stone by himself, other than the realization that summer was passing? Winter was looming. Once the pass is closed, it would be another year before you could see her. Maybe he had looked at the sky and seen boiling weather approaching. But just as I'd done when I'd got a late evening phone call during a growing storm, he'd said to himself, I can make it. But he was wrong. I'll just throw it open to questions or comments. Anybody?